Our next guest is uh, Kitty Calhoun. So she first uh, roped up in South Carolina at the age of 18. And when I say roped up, you know what I mean, right? Uh, ice climbing? Okay, great. Come on now, be with me here. All righty. So she started ice climbing uh, a year later, which led her to winter ascents in the Rockies, where her passion for alpine climbing began. Kitty has traveled to all seven continents, summiting glaciers, and in recognition of her accomplishments, she received the American Alpine Club's Underhill Award for Excellence in Mountaineering. On a rare ascent uh, of the Diamond Couloir in Mount, Mount Kenya in 2005, Kitty realized that she might be doing that ascent, that route uh, for the last time due to climate change. She then began a, be, became a, an advocate for climate action and gave a TED talk called Last Ascents. Most recently, she climbed in Alaska with Molly Kawahata, who worked on climate change for the Obama administration, and a documentary film, Scale of Hope, was produced from that climb and was released last year in 2022. So if you would please give a huge round of applause for this really legend and pioneer in this business, Kitty Calhoun. Come on up, Kitty. Okay, um, <laughs> I didn't really need to, uh, I didn't need to go for a run this morning to get a cardio workout, <laughs> my heart's racing right now. <laughs> so uh, I think we're on a journey, um, figuring out where we fit in with climate change together. I wonder how many of you first read about climate change and stories about polar bears. But, you know, it, that seemed distant to me, far away. And uh, it wasn't until I started noticing ice and snow roots in the mountains disappearing that it hit. It hit closer to home for me. And I started to realize and as an alpinist, I'm like a canary in a coal mine. And that I, I needed to speak out. And so I uh, spoke out in a TED Talk, which I did in 2013, called Last Descents. And I'm, uh, I'm, this is how it went. Uh, next slide. I'm a Democrat, a conservative Christian. I'm the daughter of a prominent Southern attorney, a sorority sister, a debutante. I'm a minimalist. I lived out of my car for seven years. I'm a Southern Belle who excelled in climbing in the Himalayas. John Krakauer titled his article about me, How Does a Southern Belle End Up in a Place Like This? Have you got me figured out yet? Uh, next slide. I keep changing, morphing from one role to another, from uh, sponsored athlete to mountain guide to mother, and uh, I needed something in my life that didn't change, something that offered me permanence. And until I found God, I found that in the mountains. The mountains have been used as my teacher for over 30 years, and it was hard for me to admit that the one thing, stable thing in my life was changing, but they are. And I'm here to tell you the story of last ascents, routes that I've climbed that may not get a repeat due to climate change. And whether you think we can have an impact or not, we ought to at least try, and I have a new approach. Next slide. I truly had no interest in climbing because I was afraid of heights. <laughs> but I went to Outward Bound, and rock climbing was part of the course. And I noticed that my fear would dissipate if I took a leap of faith and focused only on the next move I needed to make to move upward. Climbing was totally engaging, and at this point, I wanted to, as Thoreau would say, suck the marrow out of life, to live each day as if it were my last day on earth. Next slide. I learned how to climb while attending University of Vermont, and afterward, I lived to climb. I lived out of the back of my Subaru. Next slide. 
<laughs> I only brought two of everything to use for the year. Two pairs of socks, two pairs of pants, two sweaters. I lived on $3,000 a year, which included $14 a week for food. After three years, I had enough experience to become a mountain guide. I worked mostly in Peru, Bolivia, and Nepal. Never spent a birthday under 14,000 feet. I didn't think much about cars, phones, money, computers, even what to wear. <clears throat> I was focused on micro goals rather than micro possessions. I put everything into achieving one goal at a time, and I discovered that much of the stuff we fill our lives up with didn't get me where I wanted to go, which happened to be up. <laughs> Next slide. Mountains, majestic, shimmering white snow, wind gusts that snap your tent poles like matchsticks, eerie silence, snow avalanches that suddenly cut loose and destroy everything in its path, cold black skies filled with dazzling stars, and the presence of giant mountains that seemed the only thing that changed was me. Next slide. In 1987, I went to climb Dalagiri, an 8,000-meter peak in Nepal, to do the third ascent of the Kirtika McIntyre route on the east face. It was a thin ribbon of ice, very difficult, and to do an early repeat of this visionary route would still mean leaving a legacy. Next slide. Most Himal uh, expeditions in the Himalayas at that time were composed of 8 to 12 men, and they employed several hundred porters to carry their equipment to base camp, and then several Sherpas to carry their gear up the mountain. As you may have realized, this was not my style. Next slide. We were a team of four, John and Matt Culberson, Colin Grissom, and myself. None of us had tried to climb an 8,000 meter peak, and I was the only one who had even seen one. We were on a tight budget, of course, cost us 3,000 apiece, including airfare. Next slide. Base camp was at 15,000 feet. We set to work immediately establishing a route through the glacier to a pass. Next slide. I'd been studying the photo for months, planning, dreaming. In my excitement, we started to traverse toward the east face. I unroped for my teammates and started running as fast as I could in the soft, sun-baked snow. I kept running. I didn't see any ice. I kept running. And the pass started to drop away. And the entire face came into view. There was only a tongue of ice, which had not completely formed. Water slithered over bare rock over the, last 2000, the lower 2,000 feet. Now, I couldn't believe it. I, it was there in the photos, but I was too late. I sat and cried. We ended up having to settle for an ascent of the Northeast Ridge, and in doing so, I became the first American woman to climb the peak. But still, we weren't able to climb the east face, and in fact, no one has, and I think it's seen its last ascent. This route and other features, such as the ice curtain on the diamond couloir of Mount Kenya, the top 33 feet of Mount Cook, the ice fields on the north face of the Eiger have all disappeared due to climate change. Next slide. The Himalayas may experience the greatest threat from climate change because the mightiest river systems in the world are fed by the glaciers. In fact, the glaciers in the Himalaya are receding faster than at any other place in the world. And this is devastating for billions of people who live down stream and depend on the rivers to irrigate their fields in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and China. The effects of climate change are most dramatic in the Himalaya, but are evident in the U.S. as well, of course, through stronger hurricanes, droughts, wildfires, floods, crop failures, rising temperatures. Next slide. Still, I would tend to dismiss it as too big for me to make a difference. Or is it someone else's problem? I am, after all, a self-sufficient, independent person. Yet, I was haunted by the quote by John Dunn. 
Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. How can I take personal responsibility for something so vast as climate change without entirely derailing my own life? Although the Cassine Ridge on Denali is not in danger of being a last descent, other routes in Alaska are, but it was on the Cassine that something happened at the edge, something teased from the void, something of a clue to this riddle. Next slide. I asked Colin Grissom, in 1985 to climb Denali with me via the Cassine Ridge because few people climb it. It's technically quite difficult and sustained. We needed to be acclimatized to the altitude in order to climb fast and get up the mountain and back down quickly so as to not get caught in one of its infamous storms. So we elected to acclimatize by climbing the easier west buttress up to 17,000 feet. Next slide where we left a cache of food and fuel as we would use that route for our descent. Then we skied all the way back down to the intersection of the northeast fork of the Cahiltna Glacier. Next slide. This is where we took off to reach the base of the Cassine and where we had buried a cache of food and fuel for our ascent. We started digging up our cache and we found all of our food except for our 40 Snickers bars. Yeah, some hungry climber had stolen them. And this was devastating for us because we had counted on those calories. So we started up the Valley of Death with our remaining food, which was about six days worth. The first section of the route is sustained 50 degree ice slope and that ice never gets any sun. So it's extremely hard and brittle. And we had to climb for 16 hours straight before we got to where we could uh, find a flat place to sit and sleep. And it was so cold at night, uh, next slide, that uh, we it was so cold at night that we couldn't sleep, so we chose to uh, climb during the, the night and sleep during the day. And our sixth day on the route, we made it to our, next ca our last camp. Next slide. The next day, we ate the last of our food and set off for the summit. All of a sudden, a big storm with high winds came over the mountain and dropped down on us unexpectedly. We had to go back and set up our tent again and wait out the storm. This storm lasted for five days, during which time we had no food and only enough fuel to melt snow to make two cups of water per person per day. So we were getting hungry, dehydrated, weak, and scared. Colin was starting to shiver from the cold. He didn't have enough calories to keep himself warm. Next slide. <laughs> so I offered to get in a sleeping bag with him to warm him up. Uh, he took one look at me and I guess I wasn't looking too good. And he just <laughs> said, oh, no, it's not worth it. It won't work. Um, the zippers are incompatible. <laughs> anyway, next slide. Colin was used to fasting, though, having been an all-American wrestler at 167 pounds. At one point, I realized how de desperate our situation was becoming because he asked me for the trash bag, and I watched him proceed to tear it open and find the empty Lipton cup of soup packets and lick the insides. We managed to wait out the storm, and when it finally ended, we were feeling weak and lethargic. Get my crampon strap securely tightened over my overboots was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I realized that we couldn't get out al alone. Uh, we, neither one of us could make it out alone. And I had one Snickers bar hidden since the beginning of the trip, and I gave that entire bar to Colin, and I watched him inhale it. Uh, the whole thing before he even realized what had happened. Fighting, feigning, uh, next slide. Fighting, feigning spells. We made it up over the top of the mountain and back down. And from this expedition, uh, I learned something really important. I, I gained a sense of understanding of what I can do without and a greater appreciation for what I have. Walt Whitman said, we are each a unique sum of parts, but we share a destiny where we are in influencing the outcomes even in the most remote regions of the planet. 
my entire life has pointed towards minimalism as an approach toward reaching our goals. I'd like to leave you with a new twist on an old message. If we continue to take, consume, use it all up, then we may find at the crux of our lives that we have nothing left to give and nothing left to leave behind. Since I gave my TED talk, I learned more about voluntary simplicity. On the website Simply, Simply Collective, they state, voluntary simplicity is a way of life that rejects, rejects high consumption, materialistic lifestyles of consumer cultures. It doesn't mean living in poverty or indiscriminately rejecting the advantages of science and technology, but rather by Examine and afresh our relationships with money, material possessions, the planet, ourselves, and each other. Voluntary simplicity is about discovering the freedom and contentment that comes with knowing how much consumption is truly enough. Next slide. I'd like to take you back now to my 2005 Mount Kenya expedition when I first started realizing that roots in the mountains are sea and last ascents. Not only that, but a whole ecosystem that involves the interaction of plants, animals, and traditional cultures is threatened. Next slide. Jay Smith and I invited Jim Danini and Brad McMillan to climb some classic rock roots on the northeast side of Mount Kenya. Next slide and put up some new routes on nearby peaks. We brought our ice gear with us just in case we could climb the Diamond Kular on the other side of the mountain, but we weren't counting on it because it had been shriveling in size and last climbed nine years before. Next slide. It was a four day hike to base camp and as Jim described it, it was a stunning mountain set in the center of the Kenyan savanna a landscape where they shamelessly allow zoo animals to wander all over the place. <laughs> Indeed, we saw large elephant turds and police with machine guns looking for poachers and heard sounds of wild animals at night. Next slide. We decided to circumnavigate the mountain to acclimatize and to see what was left of the diamond. And just as we got to the southwest side of the mountain, where the diamond should be, the afternoon mist cleared just enough for us to see that the ice hadn't disappeared completely. The problem was we had sent our ice climbing gear or left it back at the trailhead. So we, uh, because the, the locals had said that it was no longer climbable. So our camp manager called the porters on his cell phone and asked them the, to bring our tools while we went over to the northeast face to climb rock routes. Next slide. Jay and I climbed the Eastern Groove, which is a 1,500 foot route that's relatively sustained 510 climbing and involved one bivouac. Uh, next slide. The sunrise and sunset happened much more quickly near the equator. And indeed, I noticed this orange ball rise over the mountain, over the horizon, and boom, it was, it was light. We were able to finish the route by noon. Next slide and we're down by the time the afternoon storm hit. Meanwhile, Jim and Brad did another classic climb nearby. Afterwards, we scouted for new routes to, to climb, but we weren't surprised to discover that the Brits had already done all the best looking lines. But we'd be more than happy to walk away with an ascent of the, Damas, the famous Diamond Kular. It was first climbed in 1973 by a couple Brits and in 1975, Mike Covington and uh, Yvonne Chouinard climbed the upper headwall called the Ice Curtain, which was bypassed on the first ascent. And this became known as one of the finest ice climbs in the world. Next slide. So we traversed around to the base of the Diamond Kular and Jay and I got first dibs because it was our expedition. And we got up before dawn, I took my vitamins, sharpened my tools, and set off. The crux is the first pitch, which involved 20 meters of overhanging rock with only seams in which to place gear. It was cold and windy, and spindrifts started pouring down, and Jay took the lead. It was strenuous climbing, and the only gear he could get in were some pitons, and one in particular was key 
because it went in a small slot in the back of a box. And since it was overhanging, he was placing pitons and he had to aid up most of that section. So when it was my turn to follow, I knew I had to get out all the pitons because we would need them for fixing the rappels. But more importantly, if you know anything about male tradition and climbing, there's a bit of sandbagging and one-upmanship that goes on. <laughs> so uh, we didn't want to leave the fixed pitons for the next leader because then they would probably be able to free the pitch and then they'd come back and say, oh, it wasn't that hard of climbing. <laughs> so therefore, when I got to the piton in the back of the box, um, there was no room to hit it back and forth to get it out like a normal piton. So I know I shouldn't have done it, but I slipped the pick of my tool in the eye of the piton and gave it a relatively gentle jerk and it came out. Next slide. So it was my turn to lead and I was psyched. I took off at the end of the pitch. Since it wasn't too steep, I yelled down, start climbing. And we were simul climbing, climbing together. I was about three piece three meters above my last piece of protection, and thunk, my right tool bounced off the ice. I tried again, thunk. I looked at it, what's up? Sure enough, the pick was broken in half. That gentle jerk on the eye of the piton had weakened it. So I could hear Brad and Jim saying, serves you right. <laughs> uh, the rest of the climb, I was just gonna have to be a belayer. Where's the glory in that? Tears started to well up in my eyes. And then I thought, ah, suck it up. You know, it's not all about you. And so I decided to be the best belayer ever. And we finished the route. Next slide. <laughs> Brad and Jim <laughs> did, did, the route, did the route the next day and found it just as challenging as we had. Next slide. The next day, we went over to Hell's Gate to Olympia, which is a, th a thousand meter route, 511, supposed to be the best route in Kenya besides the Diamond Kular. It was put up by a couple of Brits, Ian Howell and Ian Allen. But the holds, the handholds, were hidden under layers of thick bird shit, so thick that we couldn't climb it. <laughs> so we walked back to camp and all of these guys, not only that they, they, they could climb shit so well, but that they considered it such good climbing. <laughs> Next slide. But we had sent our cook and camp guard to town for beer, but while everyone was gone, a tribe of baboons sneaked in and raided our camp. They ate my vitamins for active women, <laughs> our, our Lamotil, which stops you up if you have diarrhea, or Ambien, which, which puts you to sleep, <laughs> Jim's chalk and my toothpaste. So the climbing trip was over for us, but it was just beginning for the baboons. <laughs> Next slide. But first we had to visit the Maasai Mara game reserve to see the animals and the famous Maasai warriors. They tend to cattle and, uh, and they're renowned for the courage in killing off, off lions who attack their herds. So I was wondering, where did they get their courage? And a Maasai god explained how he drank the blood of a cow, with the, which he withdrew with a syringe from its neck to give him strength. I thought of my special vitamins. <laughs> I watched him throw in his spear, and I thought of my black diamond rages, my ice tools of choice for the diamond. Although I'm different from a Maasai warrior, though, I think we have a similar basic desire to know the meaning of our existence, and it can't be found on TV or in the refrigerator. Next slide. Looking back on my visit to the game reserve, I've become concerned as I've realized that both traditional human communities and wildlife are enclosed in ever-diminishing parks and wilderness and, and, and uh, Wangari Mathai, leader of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya, works to help people make connections between their own problems and their degraded environments. She says, nature defines who we are and how we see ourselves. And without conservation and sustainable development, 
the climate will become warmer and drier, the glaciers on Mount Kenya will vanish, and savannas will take the place of forests. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, I want to tell you about my most recent climb now, when I was asked to be a part of the Scale of Hope film project. I was still trying to figure out what was the best way to address climate change. Was it through each person doing their part, or was it through collective action, or was there some other best way forward? I was told that Mali Kawahata was an aspiring alpinist who worked on climate change policy for the Obama administration, was bipolar, and wanted a climbing partner to do a route in Alaska. I was really excited about this opportunity to get to know Mali. While waiting out storms on our expedition to climb the mini moonflower buttress on Mount Hunter, I had ample time to dig deeper into climate change. As has been brought up many times already, um, one of the most troubling issues is the accusation that I'm hypocritical when I speak of uh, reducing our carbon footprint, yet I travel to climb. So here are Molly's thoughts on that. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So I was reading this article about the outdoor industry and how athletes and brands are trying to get serious about their carbon footprint. And it actually linked to carbon footprint calculator. It was actually made by UC Berkeley. Right next door to Berkeley actually is Richmond, California, which is a community that lives in the shadow of a Chevron refinery. A massive fire at a Chevron refinery in Richmond, California, sent toxic smoke billowing into the air. Breaking news out of Richmond, a spill at the Chevron refinery threatening the health of the Bay and the people near it tonight. They're called a the frontline community, primarily a community of color, as they often are. Over 14% of that community lives in poverty because they ask for my zip code and my income. I'm going through this based on the US Census data of an average person that lives in Richmond, California. I'm putting in the median income of somebody who works in retail there. All right, here are the recommendations it gives me. Are you ready? Buy a more efficient vehicle. Purchase an alternative fuel vehicle. Purchase a hybrid vehicle. Telecommute to work. Purchase a tankless water heater. Purchase a high efficiency cooling system. All of these things require immense upfront costs. I mean, who are the types of people that can follow these? They're telling me, turn off lights. Is that the solution here? If I use electricity at night, am I polluting? This calculator tells me yes. It's taking a system based in fossil fuels and it's apportioning blame onto the end users who are forced to use it. That's why the carbon footprint itself is a complete joke. They're talking to a specific, extraordinarily privileged, wealthy group of people in America. This concept of an individual carbon footprint, it was popularized by British Petroleum, or BP. We've all been fed a lie. These people have been fed a lie, so much so that they went and made one themselves. Molly also said, or is, is adamant that we, that we understand that climate change problems affect not just climbing and skiing, but more basically clean air and water and public health. Climate change mitigation, she says, needs to happen through public policy, and our superpower is the power to vote. Even when we're not in the middle of elections, you can become informed, support climate lobby work, join organizations, write letters to legislators. My next question was, so where does this leave my message of voluntary simplicity and, um, and rejecting overconsumption? Where does that all fit in? This was another discussion that I had with Molly. Next slide. I'm really enjoying getting to know Molly as a friend, you know. 
not just a common partner, but somebody that I enjoy discussing issues with and hearing things from her perspective. I talk about like, you know, being a minimalist and how that served me well in the mountains, you know, and so that you don't you don't use it up, take it or consume it all, so you have something left behind. Yeah. You know, and I think the same thing goes for the the earth, you know, in terms of long term sustainability, but you know, in terms of the big picture, like people are like, yeah, but what difference does one person make? 70% of carbon emissions come from 100 companies. And your carbon footprint is on average 16 to 17 tons of carbon a year. Nobody can compete with the fossil fuel industry in their own lives. Carbon footprint's just not big enough. But it would be hypocritical in terms of, I'm voting for this person because of they recognize climate change, but I'm not changing the way I personally live my life. That sort of feels um, inconsistent in terms of if you live through your values. I am a huge advocate for anybody that wants to make those changes in their own life, should. It's a tremendous privilege to be able to afford to make those changes, to have the time, the energy, and the resources. People who are greening their lives, they want to do more, which is great. They're probably already voting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Registering people to vote. Expand the electorate. Yeah. When we do this, we see it every year this happens, progressives get elected. When progressives get elected, climate policies are put in place. You know, teamwork is so important. If you just have people that are just like you all the time, you don't grow. You really only grow by working with people who have different opinions or different ways of looking at things. And I'm finally <laughs> becoming a little bit wiser old lady because I've started really listening to people <laughs> who have a different opinion than me <laughs> and hanging out with those people more. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So uh, I'd just like to finish in saying, um, in relating, uh, Molly says it best, in relating climbing a difficult peak to fighting climate change. If you don't try to climb something that's, you don't try to climb something that's literally impossible. You have to know that you could get to the top. The climate movement is the same. You have to know that that solution, that promised land is there and we are well on our way. That's why when we lead with hope, when we realize that we can clean up the air for everybody, we can put people back to work, we can invest in communities that have been left behind, that we can address racial injustice, social injustice, environmental injustice, economic injustice. When you know that's possible, and not only possible, it's waiting for us. We're getting there. Then that keeps you fighting another day. Thanks. Kitty Calhoun, everyone. So Kitty's going to take just a couple of questions. Do we have any questions in the audience? And Laura's going to bring a mic to you so we can get those answered for you. You know, those of you who continue to watch via the live stream, thank you for staying with us. And you can submit your questions there, and we'll try our best to get the answers to you. Um, go right ahead. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, that was really amazing, really inspiring. I just have one question. Yeah. Um, how did your cardio get that high up here when you've been doing these sort of things? Because me, just like looking at the pictures, I have fear of heights. So how, how do you get so much pressure about speaking here? Is it something you're not used to do? No, I'm not. It scares me to death. But you know, it's like, it's, uh, I guess risk is part of, you know, it's, nothing, it's like nothing ventured, nothing gained. And uh, there's, and uh, Tyler was talking about yesterday about how we have to embrace change. And so we have to, uh, and we have to, and, and change, you know, there, there's, it's related to risk. But things are changing around us all the time. And we have to be willing to move. We have to be willing to um, risk it all because we have everything to gain from taking the risk. And so I guess that's the same way I think about speaking. <laughs> Well, thank you, buddy. You're doing that great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. There's... 
So we had a lovely conversation earlier mm -hmm. today, and you're amazing. Thank and you. I just had no idea, and this has just been incredible. I've watched every, almost all of the presentations, and this was just fantastic. I mean, like, so great. So I kind of get a giggle. Um, can you tell everyone what your advice to me was about climbing? Oh, yeah, don't look down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could all be climbers if you aren't already. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Kitty, thank you so much. Great to meet you and definitely inspiring. <laughs>